We live in the best of times. We live in the worst of times. We live in a, a time where the average human being has more human dignity, more possibility, more potential, more material prosperity, more education than at any other time in human history. And we live in the worst of times. We live in a moment in which our progress itself threatens to consume us. The gap between the wealthy right, and the poor grows larger and larger, in which two, three, four billion human beings in the face of the planet don't have the resources needed. Yes, there are two futures, the worst of times and the best of times. There's also a third future, is that we know this. So we are entering the future knowing that it could go one way or the other. In order to engage a tale of two futures, to enact the future, to choose the future that we know is possible, we need not only a memory of the past, we need a memory of the future. We live in a world of outrageous pain, depression, addiction, trauma dot the landscape of our world. What does outrageous pain mean? It means that 17,000 children every day die of starvation in a world that has enough food to feed each child four times over. We know more of the pain and we can feel it escalating person by person and we can also feel in the environment that we could be at the edge of a catastrophe and a collapse of our life support system. So why don't we act? Why don't we move? Why don't we seek to change the status quo? We're usually told that we don't act because we're lost in our ego, because we're lost in our selfishness, but really there's a deeper reason. The reason we don't act is not because we're so bad, it's because we're so good. The reason people don't act is they feel helpless because of the immensity of the crises and the fact that the people who are in power and control, whether it be in government or heads of religions or heads of universities, don't seem to know what to do. There's a learned helplessness in reality today. There's a global action paralysis because we're so overwhelmed by all the suffering, by the outrageous pain, we think we have to heal the whole thing. We don't act because the gap between our ability to feel the pain and our ability to heal the pain is too great. And in that gap between our ability to feel and our ability to heal, we shut down, we close our hearts. Any one of us watching in this moment felt they had the ability to heal pain in the world in a significant way would drop everything and go to heal the pain. In order to have hope for the future, when we feel the radical pain of the moment, it's also very helpful to look way back to the past, not just the immediate past, but if you look back at the billions and billions of years of evolution, go all the way to the origin of creation and come forward again, what you see is every time there was radical breakdown and pain, nature jumped to a higher system. So it seems that the struggle to create a universe was painful, but the result of the pain and the stress was more wholeness, more connectivity, more complexity. So right now, when we look at the pain that we're facing, if we look back, even just to the immediate past, it's overwhelming. But if we see that there's a pattern in nature to take a jump to a higher order, to greater freedom, to greater complexity, we're given courage. It takes a lot of insight and courage to think you can make a difference, but the fact is you can. We 
live in a world of outrageous pain. And the only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. Outrageous love is not ordinary love. Ordinary love is a strategy of the ego. We call it love in order to get some comfort, some security. Ordinary love is reactive. It reacts to a situation, but it doesn't actually take us home. It doesn't make us feel alive. It doesn't make us feel like life is self-evidently meaningful. It doesn't fill us with a radical joy and creativity and aliveness. When ordinary love arises in you, it's your personal ego, not necessarily a bad ego, but an ego wanting to do some good, and it's always limited. Outrageous love is not mere human sentiment. Outrageous love is the heart of existence itself. When I think of outrageous love, I start with the origin of the universe. If you want to think of the most outrageous act, it's to originate a universe from no thing at all. So the very origin of the universe is outrageous. Outrageous love is what leading edge physicists today are calling the inherent ceaseless creativity of reality that moves towards deeper and deeper levels of connection, mutuality, recognition, union, and embrace. And outrageous love is, if you like spiritual language, it's the God impulse. If you like more secular language, it's the evolutionary impulse. And that evolutionary impulse is personal. It lives in us. It's much more than just a personal egoic love of what I can do in my small way. I realize each one of us is an expression of the process of creation loving. So what that does for me personally, and I'm just really beginning to get it, is there's no limit to how much love I can give. There is no limit because every time I give more love, I become more, I am more. And actually it feels really good. If you wanna feel the difference between outrageous love and ordinary love, hold someone's hand. If you hold someone's hand with ordinary love, it's nice, it's lovely, it gives you a moment of comfort, a moment of respite. But if you hold someone's hands with outrageous love, reality stops. Right? You're filled with the inherent, meaningful, full nature of reality. The outrageous act of creation of a universe is so awesome. And what's even more amazing is that through science, we've been able to actually measure the flaring forth of those first three seconds. And when we discovered that the first flaring forth had the exact timing and energy required to form matter, and life, you begin to see a design in those first three seconds. And even though scientists do not allude to there being a design, they're all amazed at the perfection of the attunement of those first three seconds. And some of them, in order to be able to say it's an accident, said, well, there must be billions of universe and one hit it by accident. And I said to them, it's a lot of faith in accident. One of the most powerful ideas that reigns in science today is the idea of an emergent universe. Emergence theory right, is the idea that newness emerges, that reality, the ceaseless creativity of reality, gives birth to higher and higher levels of newness, that creation doesn't stop. The universe always wants more. Now, it could have been satisfied with hydrogen, Hydrogen was a big deal. It could have been satisfied with supernovas. It could have been satisfied with Earth, a barren and beautiful rock. But no, bacteria, life, us. Creation's not a one-time event. Creation is the intelligent property of creativity that births, that creates in every moment newness that didn't exist before. So we now realize that there's not a puppeteer outside who lives only outside, but there is a self 
organizing intelligent quality in the universe itself. To be part of a self-organizing universe, realizing the awesome power of coordination that, for example, can create a body of 50 trillion cells where no human engineer could possibly have invented the way the cells coordinate to make eyes and ears and thumbs. And this is happening without us even giving it a thought. That's called, today in science, the self-organizing universe. Turing, made famous for his enormous gift of cracking the Nazi codes during World War II. The first computers were called Turing machines. Turing writes an essay called Morphogenesis, which lays down the theoretical, scientific, and mathematical basis for this understanding that our universe self-organizes. The self-organizing universe in us is going without us organizing it. If you've ever been you know, in the forest, you're going on a hike, you see something that looks a little bit like vomit on a log, slime molds. And slime molds, right, move across the floor, the leaf floor of the forest, and then they disappear. What happens when they disappear? Actually, all of the cells separate, move in different directions, and then they come back together and continue moving forward. The slime mold self-organizes. So for years, scientists looked for who's the general cell, who's the general, who's the commander in chief, who's the CEO in a slime mold, right? Explaining to a slime mold how to actually self-organize and move forward. And they weren't able to find the generals and they thought it was just a matter of time till they would find who's running this story. Ultimately, however, based on Turing's work and his essay Morphogenesis, they realized in science that the slime mold is self-organizing. There's an inherent intelligence in the slime mold that self-organizes towards higher and higher levels of connectivity, organization, and yes, progress. The entire universe we now realize is self-organizing. But what causes self-organization to happen at a human level? What causes self-organization at the human level of reality is no less than unique self, than uniqueness. Uniqueness is the strange attractor of self-organization at the human level. What's your unique self? Your unique self is the best answer we have to the question of who are you? You are an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty that is the initiating energy and eros of all that is, that lives in you, as you, and through you, that never was, is, or will be ever again. And that irreducible, unique love intelligence that lives in you, as you, and through you expresses itself as your unique perspective. And your unique perspective births your unique insight. And your unique insight fosters your unique gift. Your unique gift allows you to address a unique need in your unique circle of intimacy and influence that can be addressed, healed, spoken to by you and you alone. When you're tapping into the impulse of creation itself, you can trust yourself. You don't doubt. You don't analyze. You don't see if it's right or wrong, but you get a feeling of flow. You get, you're in the state of grace. Sometimes people think their unique gifts need to be dramatic and public. They're always dramatic, but they don't at all need to be public. My unique gift might be healing the anger in my family. It might be breaking the pattern right, of abuse right, in my family system. It might be adopting a child. It might be finding kindness in my voice when I speak to my partner to actually make them alive and empower them so then they make me alive and then we begin to address the world differently, right? My unique gift has got to bring aliveness to the world. Don't worry so much about what the world needs. I turned 85 on December 22nd, 2014. And so Stephen Dynan gave me a big celebration. I was speaking all through internet, celebrating my birthday, saying how I got started. And now somebody said to me, well, you're 85, maybe you should declare victory and retire. And I got shocked. Declare victory, first of all, over what? And secondly, retire, impossible.
because the fact was I was feeling newer rather than older. And the newness I was feeling was that the impulse of creativity inside me has no age. So I asked the universe a question. Universe, does it make any difference for me to keep on going? Is it a contribution or is it just simply compulsiveness? <laughs> and the universe responded, Barbara, you are unique. You are a unique contribution to universal evolution. Now is your time. Keep on going, Barbara. Now with that, I really felt a power. One of the things we know from psychoneuroimmunology, right, PNI, that great field and advance in science that exploded at the end of the 20th century, the last couple of decades of the 20th century, is that the experience of being needed is what gives the human being aliveness. Not only aliveness, literally life. When a human being loses their sense of being needed, they actually die very quickly afterwards. And we have any number of longitudinal studies with document this phenomena. So when you actually realize your true essence, you actually realize your true nature as a human being, you realize that you're needed by all that is, that you've got that unique gift to give. And so reality waits for the gift and you're energized, you're enlivened, literally enlivened through the gift. So to realize your unique self is to actually hear the whisper of reality intimately inviting you and embracing you, right? To be born into your fullness saying, I love you, I love you, I choose you, I choose you and I need you, I need you, I need your gift. I can't do it without you. Let's partner together. What's the future gonna be? It begins with our ability to wake up into our own aliveness and close the gap between our ability to feel and our ability to heal. When you look back at the history of Homo sapiens, you see a lot of pain, a lot of struggling, a lot of killing, a lot of dominance and control for, for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's hard to have faith in our own species when we see what we've been through and what, how we've treated each other. However, something new is happening. Out of awareness of the pain, out of empathy, out of enlarged creativity and knowledge, a new human is emerging that feels able to respond creatively, that feels intrinsically loving, that yearns for participation in giving their best. And I think there's a new species emerging out of Homo sapiens sapiens. You certainly wouldn't think that the whole evolutionary process ends here with us. We live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. When you and I feel outrageous love, we're not doing this alone. The force of creation is with us, so the power of outrageous love is outrageously great. So what do you do? You want to awaken as an outrageous lover. Well, what does an outrageous lover do? An outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. When ordinary love arises in you, it's your personal ego, not necessarily a bad ego, but an ego wanting to do some good, and it's always limited. But when you feel outrageous love, and there's no limit to the amount of love you're capable of feeling, what I realize is the force is with us. When that outrageous love, when that evolutionary love awakens in a human being, then the human being becomes potent, becomes powerful, becomes awake. Then when I awaken as outrageous love, I'm filled with an aliveness, a potency, a power that's unimaginable. All of 13.7 billion years of evolution, emergent evolutionary love conspired to manifest through billions of synchronicities, the unique incarnation of love intelligence, that is you, in order to commit those outrageous acts of love. The big difference between the outrageous lovers and the ordinary lovers is the outrageous lovers say yes, and they'll take a step, and then they get another step, and then they get more, and then it goes quantum. To be an outrageous lover is to see with God's eyes. It's to widen your perspective. It's to have eyes to see, to clarify your perception. 
So how do we actually come awake again? How do we awaken as outrageous lovers? When we realize that actually it's not all ours to heal. Right? No one person can heal the whole thing, and they're not supposed to. It's not designed that way. It's designed for us to awaken as irreducibly unique selves, unique expressions of the love intelligence with a capacity to commit our own unique outrageous acts of love, where we take responsibility for addressing a unique need in our unique circle of intimacy and influence. And we get out of business as usual, not by healing the whole thing, but by healing that which is in front of us. Sometimes people say, who do you think you are to dare to feel that you can do acts of greatness and outrageous love? And in our culture, there is sometimes the idea that you should diminish your greatness in order not to be over-dominating or too much for people. And it takes some courage to dare to go the whole way with your greatness. And you need to get others to go with you because otherwise they'll resent you. So I believe that the democratization of greatness is really the founding of the new culture. We think we need to heal the whole thing, but we don't. We need to commit our unique, outrageous acts of love. One day, I was especially grateful for something, and I was saying, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. It was just pouring out of me, and then I was silent. And I heard this voice that said, thank you, Barbara. And it was shocking, but I realized that, of course, when we're giving thanks and gratitude to the divine process of creation, the divine process of creation is reciprocating because it is creating us to be expressing the divine. And it's not like serving God or helping God, but in a way being the expression of God. We're waiting for Superman to do it for us or Superwoman, but actually Superman and Superwoman is us. Each of us in our very beingness in our very essence has superpowers. We think we're supposed to heal it all. But not only can't you do that, that's not the way it works. Systemically, that's not the nature of reality. It just doesn't work that way. The way reality is set up, the self-organizing universe, is that you commit the unique outrageous acts of love that are yours to commit, which are an expression of your unique genetic structure, cellular structure, molecular structure, all of the synchronicities of interior and exterior reality that came together, conspired, breathed together to manifest the unique you that's unlike any other. It's very rare for a person to realize that their unique best is exactly what the universe needs from them. When I awaken and I realize I'm Superman, I'm Superwoman, reality needs my gift, reality needs my service, then a new reality, a new possibility, right, begins to be ushered in. Let's hold the possibility that when we ourselves are in this frequency of outrageous love, the evolution of love coming through us in gratitude and feeling the gratitude from the process of creation that the coordinating genius of the universe is going to connect that which is creative. We fear our greatness more than we fear anything else. We live in the comfort of our everyday lives doing business as usual because we're afraid to step out of our comfort into our pleasure, right? The pleasure of our greatness. Every person has a genius and that genius is needed by all that is. We haven't had a culture with a democratization of greatness. We're not waiting for one great person. We're not waiting for a messiah from the outside from a particular religion or people. We're not waiting for Superman to come down. We're actually realizing that we are Right? The infinite creativity of reality awakening, expressing uniquely through us, even as we know that all of reality is intelligent and holds us in every moment. When we awaken in that sense, right, a new era is dawned. The question is, how do I find the unique act of outrageous love if I want to be an outrageous lover? 
and there are 10,000 million things I could do, how do I tune in to the one that I'm uniquely suitable for? When I awaken to my irreducibly unique nature, I don't separate from the whole, I become part of the whole. Right? Uniqueness doesn't alienate me, it doesn't separate me. Uniqueness is like a puzzle piece. Right? The puzzle piece, based on its unique contours, fits perfectly into the larger whole, and it completes the larger whole. And as the puzzle piece fits into the larger puzzle, it's held, it's located in the larger whole. That's the experience of being a unique self. And when you're in your unique self, your very quality of uniqueness attracts you to other unique selves. And you begin to self-organize together and to create larger and larger resource and power and energy, which begins to be able to transform and heal and shift everything. This is a process of discovery by attunement to the impulse of attraction within you. And the way you do it is you find out what attracts you, even if it's a very small thing to begin with. And then you act on the attraction. And you see if you can find two or more who are already somewhat attracted to what you're attracted to. And then you get together into a field of resonance. And the field of resonance begins to amplify the unique act that is yours alone to do while it's amplifying the other people's unique acts that only they are able to do. And then you start falling in love with each other. When a group is doing this together, what happens is you get coordinated like the cells in the body. What we begin to realize is that there's actually a unique self-symphony of individual unique selves, each called right to their own unique expression, and then they come together and collaborate and bring their uniquenesses together in larger fields of action and intelligence and begin to impact the whole. And when you take your unique self and your unique outrageous acts of love out of the story, it's like the symphony is missing a particular instrument and the music is off and that Offness in the music exponentializes through the system, creating instead of creativity and fullness and, and eros and joy, it creates incompleteness, it creates contraction, it creates grasping, and in the end it creates hurt and fear and brutality. The mental mind of figuring it out step by step by step will block the self-organizing process. And it's not that we don't want to use our mental mind. We can list all things and we can put it down, but then, there is spontaneity, already knowing, speaking from higher mind, coordinating with other people like in a great football game when they know what the other is doing. And it's my sense that a higher form of self-organization among humans is emerging when you move into synchronicity, shared purpose, and outrageous love because you're actually tapping in to the coordinating power of universe itself. The analytical mental mind can prepare you for this, but it has to take second place. And in my own practice now, as I am practicing outrageous love, I can't overplan it. <laughs> I have to be spontaneous, ebullient, joyful, and know in the moment what to do. To awaken as an outrageous lover is to take your place in the unique self-symphony. The symphony of unique selves, of unique outrageous lovers committing their unique outrageous acts of love. There's no general, there's no guru, there's no CEO who's gonna make it happen. It's a bottom-up self-organizing universe, right? Self-organizing based on the strange attractor of your unique self towards higher and higher levels of mutuality, recognition, union, and embrace. What a world to live in, and that world needs you. Every life is an attempt, a powerful, heroic attempt, right, to respond to the questions of our life. What are the questions? The questions are, are you ready to play a larger game? The questions are, who are you? The questions are, are you ready to participate in the evolution of love? What do you mean, the evolution of love? Isn't love eternal? The evolution of love means that we move from a felt sense of care, love, and concern for our own people, the people that give us security, and then to a larger group, to our nation, 
and then to an even larger group, right, to all human beings on the face of the planet, and then to an even larger group to all beings that exist anywhere and every place, not only human beings, and then even larger to all of reality itself. So the evolution of love is the drive to ever-expanding circles of love. It's impossible to imagine that this entire process of evolution and of the evolution of Homo sapiens sapiens would stop here with us. When not only is it possible to imagine, but it's possible to imagine the reality that Mother Earth is giving birth to an emerging species capable of greater love. And all of us all over the world who are feeling love in our heart, empathy, caring, desire to give our best, we are an emerging species and Mother Earth needs us. Our love lists are too short. The people on our love lists are the same people that are on our egocentric security lists. Right? That's problematic. That means that our love lists are ordinary love lists. Outrageous love lists have many more people. When you're an outrageous lover, you get to fall in love all the time. But falling in love doesn't mean romantically falling in love. It doesn't mean sexually falling in love. It means to see the irreducibly unique beauty, potential, gorgeousness of the possibility that can emerge from that person, from that situation, from that dynamic, from that moment. What stands against falling in love? Always jealousy, contraction. But jealousy comes from not recognizing that you're an irreducibly unique, gorgeous self. The second you actually step into the irreducibly unique beauty right, of your unique self, jealousy disappears. You begin to be able to open up to devotion, to delight in other human beings, and you begin to be able to come together as unique self-symphonies to co-create right, the present and the future, and to be able to create right, resources available for every human being on the planet. And I have a vision of the future that when enough people are acting out of outrageous love, a spontaneity and resonant field is established of this collective love that allows the coordinating genius of universe to coordinate human civilization. It's going to connect innovations, breakthroughs, solutions, human creativity, human love, at a scale that could be called the planetary awakening of a divine humanity. We need to wake up, grow up, and show up. What does it mean to wake up, to wake up to our true nature? Right? To grow up is to grow up from egocentric consciousness. I only have a felt sense of care and concern for me and my people. Right? To ethnocentric consciousness, I have a felt sense of love, care, and concern for me and my nation. To world-centric consciousness, I have a felt sense of love, care, and concern for me and every human being on the planet. And then I really grow up to cosmocentric consciousness. I have a felt sense of love, care, and concern for all of reality. It's not enough to wake up, though. I can't just grow up. I've got to show up. And to show up is to commit the outrageous acts of love that are mine and mine alone to commit. And showing up is not just about my own self-fulfillment, right? It's about living an epic, an extraordinary life by giving my unique gifts. Wake up, grow up, and show up. For billions of years, nature has been evolving. But the species in, who were involved in that were not aware. And there were five mass extinctions before we got here. There are billions of species extinct before we got here. But nonetheless, the process kept moving to higher order, more complexity, more intelligence. And now that that process has become self-aware, really since the 60s with the discovery of cosmogenesis, the universe has a history. It has been, is now evolving, and we are part of the evolution. So we are evolution becoming conscious of itself. We live in an entrepreneurial universe that's always seeking new connection, new value, the creation of new value, of new connectivity, right, of new innovation, right, new creativity, right, is the entrepreneurial expression of an entrepreneurial universe. The planet has grown a new nervous system. Facebook is the third largest nation in the world. We have Google with the wisdom of the world in the palm of the hand. Billions and billions of cell phones. 
what you can see from an evolutionary perspective is the world is getting a nervous system, a global nervous system. Our dysfunctionalities are increasing. Our innovations are already increasing. Nature, it has a tendency for all of those to interact, and we've been given an interactive media. That is not an accident from an evolutionary perspective. It's a necessity. If nature wants to continue the process of creation and not have us go extinct, we've been given the opportunity to connect by conscious choice now, rather than simply natural selection. We have finite resources, that's true. But we have one unlimited source. And that unlimited source is, right, our unlimited entrepreneurial creativity, our unlimited evolutionary creativity, which is a direct emergent from our unique self. In the old world, an entrepreneur was considered someone who's slightly wild, creative, probably reckless, somewhat greedy, and it's a very narrow elite group of people, right, often creating possibilities that the world doesn't need, right, in order to profit, right, in order to pursue greed. But actually, there's a much deeper view of entrepreneurship which enlivens the world today, which is that every human being is an entrepreneur. Every human being has a unique gift. Every human being has a new value possibility that they can put into the equation, the calculus of the universe. And an entrepreneur is one who's creative, one who says, there's an invitation here, and I'm gonna to respond to that invitation. I'm gonna be uniquely creative. I'm gonna unleash my evolutionary creativity in this specific place and time. Every crisis in the world at its core isn't merely a crisis of resources. We, of course, need to address resources, but at the core, it's a crisis of imagination. What would it be like when everything we know we can do works? So what's working in health? What's breaking through in energy? What's breaking through in uh, aging? What's breaking through in media? What's breaking through in new modes of self-management and governance and spirituality? And you draw a circle around that and see it synergizing. You get a picture of an awakening world. And the amazing thing about this future vision, it's already here. But it's not connected, it's not seen, and it's not known. So I think of the future right now as making the invisible world visible, making the emerging world seen. If it's true that the world could go into an environmental collapse in the next five to ten years, certainly in that same frame of time, we can connect what's working and start to invite people everywhere in the world as to what they want to create because fundamentally it's a revolution of creativity and love. There are those who claim certainty. We know everything about everything. We know why people die and why suffering happens and the exact order and design of the universe. Right? That claim has been exploded. We live in the best of times. We live in a time of limitless possibility. We live in a time of infinite potential, but we can't get lost in a kind of techno-optimism, losing sight of the outrageous pain. We're beyond the myth of separation. We live in a world of outrageous love, and love is the currency of connection. We realize that no one is separate from anyone else, even as we're all individuated expressions of the mind of reality, the mind of God. That realization, that realization of our unique expressions of the oneness coming together as a stunning symphonic expression of the unique self-symphony of outrageous love is the interior shift, the interior transformation, which the change, the change is everything. It's what's gonna chart the new future. The universe is self-organizing and self-creating. It isn't like God is handling all this. In fact, it's very obvious that the creative intention put freedom in the universe. No one's extra on the set. There's no little boy and no little girl any place in the world whose story doesn't have infinite value and infinite dignity. All of us all over the world who are feeling love in our heart, empathy, caring, desire to give our best, we are an emerging species and Mother Earth needs us. Remember that boy who came before the king? You know, when the boy said, I'm gonna be wiser than the king, the king's supposed to be all wise and all knowing, I can outsmart him. I've got a butterfly in my hand. I'll ask the king, is the butterfly alive or is the butterfly dead? 
If the king says to me, the butterfly is alive, I'll clench my hand and the butterfly will die and the king will be wrong. If the king says that the butterfly is dead, I'll open my hand and the butterfly will lift and fly away and the king will again be wrong. And so the boy comes before the king and the king looks at the boy. The boy asks his question, is the butterfly alive or dead, O great king? And the king looks at the boy and says, whether that butterfly lives or dies depends on you.